Hi, ladies and gentlemen, Terry Martin with the Illinois Channel, and I'm joined again with uh, Jeff Berkowitz. And Jeff, as we tape this on the 21st <clears throat> of March, and by the way, happy spring, everyone. Let's take a look at uh, one of the results of the election, the primary election, which we just had here in Illinois. And it is, uh, we bring this up, the 12th com congressional race where Darren Bailey, the former gubernatorial candidate, uh, of the Republican Party against Governor Pritzker was seeking to replace Congressman Mike Bost, uh, but he came very close, just failing by 2,600 votes or so uh, in the end. So, Jeff, one of the very close race, races uh, and, and significant, given that Darren Bailey was the gubernatorial candidate and was trying to establish himself even further by moving on to Congress. That's not going to happen. We'll have to see if there's any political future uh, for Darren Bailey going forward. But that wasn't the only thing happening. And you are, Jeff, you've taken a look at some of the races, I think, uh, what we call the Eastern Bloc, some of the other conservative Republicans. Right. What what can you share on that? Well, re state reps Adam Niebuhr, Blaine Wilhauer, uh, Brad Holbrook all survived primary challenges this past Tuesday. Importantly, very importantly, Wilhauer and Niebuhr Ne excuse me, Will Hauer and nee Nieberg Murray both faced teachers union backed opponents. Will Hauer won with a resounding, this comes from wire points too, shamelessly taking from wire points on this. Will Hauer wound with a resounding 79% of the vote and Nieberg, nee I keep saying it wrong, Nieberg, okay, Nieberg, an, incum an incumbent, he was an incumbent running as a write-in. They had knocked him off the ballot. He won as a write-in with an even bigger 98% of the vote. So big win for the conservatives in the Eastern Bloc, big loss for the teachers unions who came after them. And he spent several hundreds of thousands backing their candidates. And so this, look, this is an important part of the coalition, the Eastern Bloc, important part of the Republican Party coalition in Illinois. These are conservatives. Uh, these, you know, Blaine Willauer, Willauer could be a candidate for governor. He is very, very articulate. And so big. it's a big deal. It's a big win. And it comes out of downstate. You know, what strikes uh, me, what's interesting, is we see uh, Mayor Johnson in Chicago put in there by uh, the influence of the teachers' unions, of which he was an employee of the teachers union before he was becoming mayor. And yet down downstate, the teachers union don't have the influence that obviously they have in Chicago. What also strikes me is why is the teachers union spending all this money to go after some conservative Republicans in the House of uh, Illinois House when <clears throat> there's already super majorities in, of Democrats have super majorities in both the House and the Senate it's like, why are you going out of your way to spend this money that you just can't stand to have some conservative voice in the Illinois legislature? I, I suppose that's the answer. Well, somewhat arrogance and somewhat, as you know, Terry, when people have money, they want more. The teachers unions, think of it this way. Teachers unions are about membership fees for the leadership. You know, these presidents of the Chicago teachers unions in the past 300, 400 K teacher salaries in the Chicago area, the average been pushed up to hundred thousand dollars. This is a money issue and money matters and they want more. They want more Terry. And let's go over to Chicago. I know it's for folks downstate you might say, why Chicago? Well, Chicago is an important part of Cook County. When you say we're Cook going County, to Chicago, we're talking about the election results. We're going to be talking about the we're election, results, the election so results. Just to be clear right. what we're going to Chicago about. Yeah, we're not going to Chicago physically, but we're going in uh, metaphorically. And what happened in Chicago, Big a push for a big increase in, uh, in the real estate transfer tax, which would have affected not just as known as the mansion tax, because these are homes selling for over a million dollars. Uh, and uh, they're also talking about business buildings selling for over a million dollars. So it affects people in terms of their employment opportunities. When you tax business, you're gonna have less of it. When you tax employment, you're gonna have less of it. 
So this went down, big defeat for the Chicago's Teachers Union and Brandon Johnson. So you might say, well, why is the CTU involved in this? Because this is what these folks do. They've taken over the schools in Chicago. That's their base. They're looking to spread their wings across the state. And they're looking to get, and they now have a mayor who, who is a former union organizer for the Chicago Teachers Union. So it's a chaotic world we live in, chaotic state. And well, chaotic I would state. I would characterize this as it was one more money grab because Chicago is financially going down the tubes, and these people are semi-communists, certainly socialists, and they go, oh, the million-dollar home, let's tax that equity that people have built up over years. You got a bunch of people now who are in retirement. They bought a home years ago. They might have bought it for $50,000 back in the day. And now, because of inflation and other factors, it's over a million dollars. It doesn't mean these people are rich. And to go after these homes and say, we're going to have a mansion tax, it doesn't mean it's a mansion. It's just a term. It means that maybe because of this growth, uh, of real estate valuations, you got a million dollars, and the government just can't leave people alone. No, they've got to go out and do that money grab. And I would say, hey, government, here's an alternative view. If you need to balance your books, why don't you start cutting your costs? Why don't you take out a pencil and start scratching out line items in your budget? But these people don't want to do that. It's always got to be more money, more money, more money. And Jeff, you know where that leads to. That leads to people fleeing the state of Illinois, fleeing places like Cook County, because they no longer can have a decent life there when the government is always trying to reach their hand into their pockets. Two things to note before we go on, and we have to go on, is that um, it ain't over yet, as they say. It ain't, over, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. And these days, the fat lady is the mail-in votes, okay? Everywhere and always. The election is not over on March, uh, uh, yes, on um, March 19, because that used to be when it was over. But now with the mail-in votes, it could go as long. It's not likely to go as long, but these votes continue to be counted through 14 more days, April 3rd. Okay. Why so did they? Why did they count? Why don't they say that the uh, your absentee ballots uh, have to be in by election day? Well, they have to. They have to be postmarked by the election day. But if it's postmarked on March 19, they give them two weeks because the post U.S. Postal Service may take a while to deliver them. But in reality, it's thought that the vote is 54-46, with the nose having it 54 percent to 46. And it's about a 23,000 vote margin. Most people say that that's too much to overcome, even conceptually, with the mail-in votes. And we'll probably know we'll know more about that in the state's attorney's race, which we'll get to on, uh, say, Friday evening. And uh, how close is the state's attorney's Thursday. race? Yeah. So the point is, it ain't over. But most people say, yeah, as to this. As to the, and by the way, on the state's attorney's the race, we're talking about replacing Kim Fox, who is not seeking re-election. Uh, tell us who the candidates are in the state's attorney's race and where that stands. Right. And uh, the candidates in the state's attorney's race are Eileen O'Neill Burke, who has 30 years of courtroom experience, bona fide lawyer, and running initially as a law and order candidate, initially. That's how she was coming out of the gate, so to speak. And then you got Clayton Harris, and who has behind him Tony Preckwinkle, who is the pharaoh with the big P in Cook County in Chicago these days. And she was she had back Fox, who put who she she had back Kim Fox, who was the state's attorney for the last eight years. And we saw under her under her tenure in five of those last years. They had a 60% increase in violent crime, violent major crimes, okay? And then, and so she had, Preckwinkle had put Fox there. Fox had become unpopular. And so many people would say she looked to Clayton Harris. Preckwinkle looked to Clayton Harris. He was her guy. He got the slating of the Cook County Democratic Committee. And he was, he was running on safety and justice, which many people would know. That's the slogan of the George Soros uh, backed rogue prosecutors. Was he a rogue prosecutor? We don't know. Okay. But he certainly was talking less of a law and order game. Uh, Eileen O'Neill Burke, 
30 years of experience in the courtroom uh, and, you know, uh, Clayton Harris about four and doing lots of other things, political things and so forth. And that was the choice. And uh, and at the end of the at the end of the voting, Eileen O'Neill Burke had about a 9000 vote margin of, of lead. That was at the end of Tuesday. We haven't had any new votes, mail in votes counted yet. They're starting to count today. They're starting to count being watched. Both campaigns wanted to see these things being opened and we'll see how much they get to see. And by Friday night, that's tomorrow night, uh, we're taping this on Thursday. We're expected to know more as to whether that lead is there or did does uh, Clayton Harris the third come back and and uh, and win the state. And Congress. again, Burke is of the two is more the law and order, tough on law and order candidate. I mean, it's a subjective Absolutely. evaluation, but she would be more supported by those who want to crack down on crime in Chicago and to get away from the approach that Kim Fox had, which was weak prosecutions. We're not going to prosecute a lot of people. And the cops uh, demoralize because all their work goes for naught. When you have a prosecutor, most, it doesn't prosecute. Yeah, most importantly, most importantly, she had told me in a press conference <clears throat> just a few weeks ago, Eileen O'Neill Burke, when I said, are your policies going to differ from Kim Fox? And she said simply, she would detain people who were engaged in violent crimes. She would detain people who were who were arrested for violent crimes on the on the CTA, okay? She's Chicago Transit Authority, which is the main one of the main modes of public transit in Chicago. <clears throat> and she would detain people who had used guns unlawfully in violent crimes. So detain, detain, detain. That means when they're arrested, they're not going right back out on the streets pending trial. We can still detain people under the Safety Act. We won't go into the details there, but that was a push of hers. And of course, and yes, she's saying she doesn't know all the data on prosecution, but she believes in prosecuting violent criminals. And she believes in following the law. The law says shoplifting, if it's over $300, it's a felony. She says, that's the law. I will follow the law. Clayton Harris says- Jeff, let me, let, let's, I want to move along I'm here. Uh, one of the things okay. that we have talked about in the past is the loss of population in Illinois. And why? Because of the things you and I have just been talking about. Taxation and rising crime. And prosecutors who don't prosecute. So maybe the Burke, if Burke wins- We'll have to see how she performs, but maybe that might be at least addressing some of the crime issues. But let me bring up our friends from Wirepoint, and here they have uh, this, this graphic. Uh, of the 102 counties in Illinois, 93 counties have lost population since 2020. Uh, and that is, it says there, the change in population, they have 23 versus, but you know, basically over the last three to four years, uh, as we move into 24, that's uh, pretty pretty telling of of what's going on in the state of Illinois, and uh, what is it you make of that? Is you know, I th I think it's both uh, a lot of overregulation. I think it's a lot of overtaxation. I think it's a lot of crime that isn't being prosecuted, and you get the the result where people are saying enough already. Um, I don't have to put up with this, and it's time to move on somewhere else out of state. Well, and add in one thing that's very important to parents. We have 1.9 million students in public schools, public schools across the state of Illinois. Two-thirds of those, 1.2 million, are not reading at grade level, and in many cases are not really learning how to read at all. Two-thirds, Terry. This is not just a CPS problem. This is an Illinois problem, an Illinois public sector problem. So people are fleeing the state, despite what Governor Pritzker says, because of high taxes, because of high regulation, and because of failing schools, and because of a pension problem that could explode and about to explode and cause a lot of people, businesses and individuals, very and property high taxes high. that have not been diminished. Property taxes, which uh, are taking away the equity that people have in their homes. And that's, that's the private sector's savings, life savings, the private sector's savings for their retirement. 
And that property tax, and you just we talked about the mansion tax, where the government is always trying to grab more and more from the private sector and the private savings of individuals, and they're saying, why should I be pushed into bankruptcy and poverty in my old age to give massive pension payments to these re- people who have worked for the government for 20 or 25 years? Right. Uh, and, and it, it's ridiculous. And just remember, remember the flip side, we were talking about failing public schools, but they're failing at a very high expenditure. In Chicago, it's more than $30,000 per kid per year. So you're getting failing schools, kids can't read across the state of Illinois, and you're getting way too high teacher salaries. And the flip side of higher teacher salaries is high property taxes. The major component of high property taxes across the state of Illinois is high public school expenditures, which are mainly teacher salaries. So until we address some of those problems, Illinois is continuing to lose population, lose businesses, and lose political power relative to other states that are growing. And Jeff, let That's me, let's follow, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to stay with the theme of elections on the show, but uh, it's not just in Illinois. Illinois is a very blue state, but we're seeing pushback on these issues we're talking about. Too much government, too much taxation. Our schools are failing, not just in Chicago and Illinois, across the nation. And people are really starting to get fed up. And we see this in polling. And here we have in key Democrat uh, Democrat uh, voters uh, that traditionally the Hispanics and blacks, we see Donald Trump making major inroads into those with virtual tie on Hispanic voters. And of course, that's uh, the argument is why Biden has kept the border open, trying to bring in more uh, people who might vote Democrat in the future. But the, the Hispanic voters are not going for that. And in the black communities, 28%. Now, I have Democrat friends who say that's never going to happen. That's That uh, 28% will never be realized. But that's a result of a poll uh, f- conducted uh, at the end of uh, February. Uh, and we'll have to see how that pans out. But if Donald Trump were to get anywhere near those numbers of 48% Hispanics, 28% of the black vote, that would be not just a, de- a defeat for Joe Biden, that would be a destruction of Democratic candidates running for Congress across the United States because they need that base of, of support uh, to make sure their candidates uh, win. Well, it's an important part of the possible Trump victory coming up in 2024. That is the destruction of the Democratic Party coalition that involves the most reliable Democratic voters across the country are black. Certainly that's true in Illinois. Certainly it's true in many inner cities across the across the country and in a, in a certainly significant portion of the battleground states. So, if, and in Chicago, there's a, there's a movement among blacks to flip Chicago red, okay? That ain't gonna happen anytime soon. But if, again, if any part of what you just talked about, Terry, in terms of the shift of Hispanics and blacks toward the Republican party, if it's a significant shift, it's a significant destruction of the, of the, of key aspects of the Democratic Party coalition. And Biden is very worried about that. He's very worried. And now he's got the Arab vote, the Arab coalition in the Democratic Party to worry about. And so he's backing away from Israel and he's going to lose significant Israel or Jewish support. Yeah, exactly, Party exactly. And that he's he's painted himself in the corner because he's got a kowtow to the Arab vote in Michigan if he wants to carry Michigan. Right. On the other hand, uh, he's, as you just mentioned, uh, the Jewish vote, which is also historically heavily Democrat, and I suspect will remain so, but he's, he's very likely to lose some of that support uh, because of his turning his back now on Israel. He wouldn't put it that way, but obviously he's a, he and Chuck Schumer are saying Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, ought to be replaced. That's pretty outrageous that they would come out and interfere in such the politics of, so blatantly uh, of another country. What's your read? I don't know to what extent you're uh, connected with the Jewish community on the north side of Chicago, but uh, where you live. 
Uh, well, in general, are you hearing any of this? Are you getting pushback of people saying, yeah, you know, I mean, you look, you can see this here, but you can also see it nationally. Uh, you know, it's carried all over except on, say, MSNBC and CNN, certainly carried on Fox, but it's reaching mainstream America. Look, the, the choice that it depends on how smart Donald Trump wants to be, if he can avoid, if he can overcome these legal obstacles, which we perhaps will get to, you know, the four or five major cases that are out there. If he can avoid that, if he can delay that, if he can defer that, if the election can be about inflation, about crime, about immigration, about what, and about these, uh, the power of the United States to be a major force in the world, to overcome this threat from China, from Russia, from Iran, from North Korea. If those are the issues we're talking about, Trump wins, Trump wins. If he lets it be go back to these other issues that Trump uh, from time to time gets dragged into, Trump and the Republican Party lose. That's the that's it in a nutshell. We've been talking about the coalition constituency issues for Biden, but the point is Biden can't run on these issues. He can't run on immigration. He can't run on the border issues because that's a major failure he created. He can't run on inflation because he created that. He can't run on crime because he created that. He can't run on he can't run on foreign policy because America is becoming weaker under Joe Biden relative to China, relative to Russia, relative to Iran, relative to North Korea. So what can he run on, Terry? He can run on two things. Trump is a danger. He's causing us to lose democracy. That's a tough argument. And he can run on abortion. That ain't gonna win if the Republicans are smart and focus on the issues that Americans care about. Yeah, and uh, you know, the thing is, not only is uh, Trump losing, or, or Biden rather losing support as we see in the polls, uh, uh, but he is also plagued with a number of things going on uh, that have been causing uh, uh, people to doubt just uh, if he's the right guy. Uh, for the job, and one of them is we had this week the House, Re uh, the House of Representatives had a hearing yesterday, as we talk about this, that looked into what was going on, what has been going on with the um, uh, Bidens and in dealing with the Chinese, and whether the Bidens have made any money in corruption. Let's take a look, listen to what Tony Balin uh, Bobulinski, who was for a short time a business partner of uh, the Bidens and had met directly with Joe Biden as well as Hunter Biden, which uh, undermines what Joe Biden was saying, that he never talked about business dealings with his son, Hunter. Let's listen to what Tony Bobulinski testified. Mr. Bobulinski, do you know whether the Biden family made any money from China? They did, millions of dollars. I think approximately eight to nine million. The Biden family has made millions of dollars from China, correct? Correct. And you said at least nine million? Yeah, I think it's actually over 10 million, but I'll leave those uh, details up to you guys. So there you go. Uh, Tony Bobulinski saying the Bidens have made millions. He has texts from Hunter <clears throat> Biden. He has phone call records. He has documentation. It's not just his word. He has uh, evidence to back that up. And so the question about whether Joe Biden is corrupt continues to go on. A lot of evidence continues to be uncovered through these hearings. Uh, ostensibly, that's through uh, an impeachment hearing. I don't think there's any way the Republicans are going to bring up impeachment against Joe Biden with the election now, just something eight months away. But it is conceivable that this would have another bit of erosion on the uh, Biden uh, appeal for a re-election, and in a tight race, which it appears to be and will probably continue to be for some months to come, anything that Biden is losing there is obviously going to cost him. And we should also note in other polling that Biden is behind in all the seven swing states that are likely to determine who is the next president. Right, and we notice we've done, we've mentioned the problems of the National Democratic Party and Joe Biden without mentioning his age, which is 81. And then Democrats say, well, he's 81, Trump's 77, what's the difference? 
Well, the difference is Joe Biden is a visibly old, visually old 81. Trump is a visually younger, more forceful, more energetic 77. And the other thing that's been brought to the fore by a number of sources, and what we can see with our own eyes is a frail Joe Biden with questionable ability to handle mentally, intellectually, the issues that the United States president has to deal with. These are not simple issues. You have to be sharp. And people, Democrats say, oh, he's very sharp. You just can't see it. It's privately. Well, Americans believe what they can see. And if Biden's going to do another in the basement strategy without COVID, and he's not going to come out, we've seen cases, and Fox has shown it, well, others, where, where Biden is questioned, Terry, excuse me, Biden is questioned, and he, he's been talking, he's about to be questioned, and literally the handlers guide him and push him away from the press. They're not going to tolerate this, Terry, and he can't do it just by teleprompter, State of the Union, one night, coached and helped by Mets. He's got to be out there for the next seven months or he's going down, not physically. He's going down in the vote on November 5. You heard it first here. OK, you know, the other major thing that's happened is uh, the, the the effort by the uh, Democratic Party and using local prosecutors to use the law as a weapon. And everyone knows this. They've had these prosecutions going up as we tape this on Thursday, the 21st coming up on Monday. Uh, by uh, jo uh, President Trump has to come with uh, come up with about four hundred and fifty million dollars to satisfy uh, a judgment that was made against him for allegedly misrepresenting the value of his properties. And Kevin O'Leary, who people will know from Shark uh, Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary just commented on Fox. I want to play a clip here because he says this is not just about Trump. What Letitia James, the New York Attorney General, is doing is putting all of New York and the future of their business community at risk. Let's take a listen to what he has said. This is an attack on America. Hmm. And, and I don't know how you can look at it any other way. And as, a, as an investor, and I know plenty of investors who are completely disturbed by this, I mean, no one is going to put any money to work in New York in, in these amounts until this thing settles down. The whole world is watching and everybody's waiting for one thing we haven't got yet. Adult supervision. Hmm. Where is it? Where are the adults in this crazy narrative? Certainly there's got to be adult supervision at some point. And I understand, you know, the, the war going on here and all the political yada yada woof woof woof. But we need an adult in the room now. This is the United States of America under siege. Coming up. So there you go, Jeff. So Terry, here's the thing, that Trump was accused of a crime that's now he's facing a $500 million bond. And there are no victims, Terry. This is a totally fabricated lawsuit, fabricated in the trial judge, trial court of New York. We haven't heard from the appellate court. Would the New York Supreme Court do the fix here? Would the U.S. Supreme Court? Not only is it this fabricated, is people are seeing it. The voters are seeing that. The, they're seeing the funny William um, uh, Willis in Atlanta. They're seeing Letitia James. These are phony baloney. It's l using the law as a political weapon. And obviously what we see in the polls, it's not working and people are rejecting it. Yeah, the chickens are coming home to roost. This attorney general in the state of New York ran on getting Trump. And then she, then when she got elected, she said, I'm going to go find a crime. That's not the way the law is. And as Kevin O'Leary said at the end, where are the adults? Where are the legal, the, the honest brokers in the legal reform? They need to come in and step up. Jeff, uh, thanks again. And people, thanks for watching. And leave us your comments. What do you think is mm -hmm. most important? And please watch us again when we return. See you for now.